This is David Hofmeister's Unwind Your Mind Back to God, read by Tarana Singh. In today's episode, we continue unlearning the world with Book 2. In Chapter 2, this is the last and final part of the last and final section. Section 11 Use of the Body Part 2 Friend, let's go back to the ego's uses for the body. Can you address those? David We can take them one at a time. Pride gets at the subject-object split or the belief in personhood. Pride really comes down to the desperate attempt to maintain a belief in personhood, of being an individual person and actually perceiving other individual persons. It keeps that split between self and other in the mind. It reinforces it by drawing attention to oneself, through pride in accomplishments, physique, country, sports, family, etc. Things in the world that are considered very good. Friend, can you talk about spiritual pride? David, spiritual pride is taking pride in what one knows. Turning the spiritual journey into a book-learning feat or a display of abilities. Underneath that is still the motive to draw attention to the small self, to the personhood. It is a very subtle trap. For example, as the belief in separation is let go of in the mind, Seeming powers can arise, such as psychic abilities, telepathy, levitation, or psychokinesis. The mind can latch on to those and say, Look at me. Look at what I can do. But the I is still the little I, the personal I. Someone could become a lecturer, a workshop leader, a healer. But when that gets personified, when the mind identifies with the person as being the focal point, it is still trying to draw attention to itself. Jesus pointed to heaven saying always, that it is the Father who speaks. It is the Father who is the source of all healing. He always took the second place, pointing at all times to the Father in heaven. This is a sense of true humility. This is a mind that knows what it is. It knows what its source is and is not attracted to the role of being the center of the universe in the sense of placing the personal thought form self at the center. It always points to the Father. Spiritual pride can take many forms. It can show up in a group, for example, where there is an identity of having found the way. This is yet another spiritual trap of identifying with the small I, with the personal self. Pleasure is also part of the world of duality. Pleasure and pain are equally unreal. Both are defenses against the truth 
in that they are both techniques the ego uses to convince the mind to maintain the body identity. To uphold the belief that the body is real. The mind can perceive the flesh or recognize the spirit. It is one or the other. They are mutually exclusive in awareness. If one is aware of the body and the world, then the recognition of the spirit is kept from awareness. The pursuit of pleasure is a distractive device, a trick that anchors the mind in the belief that the body is real. It seems to be very attractive. This is what the Course refers to as the attraction to guilt. The deceived mind does not equate guilt and pleasure. Pleasure is seen as something desirable, something to be sought after and enjoyed. A lot of times you will hear statements like, God wants you to enjoy himself. God wants you to enjoy yourself. Enjoy the many pleasures of the world. But from the metaphysical perspective, first of all, God is spirit. God does not know about the physical projected world. God only knows his creations or his creation which is the sun and he knows him as perfect. This is a pure, abstract, infinite relationship that has nothing to do with form in any way. The mind is unaware that the pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain are the same. By pursuing pleasure, one is also pursuing pain. The pleasure is a guise. Friend, and both of them act as substitutes for God. David, yes. The pursuit of wealth and the belief in poverty are another version of the same split or guise. If someone is poor, it seems to be a world of scarcity. They yearn for better times, more possessions and an easier life. On the other hand, those that do actually accumulate wealth and possessions still feel the pain and anguish and the depression. We find the same thing. The mind is still seeking for happiness, peace and contentment in the world. It is just seeking in the wrong place. Peace, contentment and happiness are in the mind and in the letting go of the false beliefs. So there is a quick look at pleasure. Attack is also something that is very important as a defense against the truth. It is a witness that separation has occurred. To truly see that separation is impossible seems to be at odds with what the body's eyes show because as one looks around through the body's eyes and distorted perception, one sees attack in many different forms. There seem to be arguments everywhere. Whether they seem to be verbal attacks or physical attacks with fists, knives, guns, tanks 
are bombs. There seems to be a world where attack is a common experience. But the mind cannot attack. The mind is abstract. It is one. It can only make up body fantasies where attack seems to be real. The ego's use of the body for its fantasies of attack definitely make guilt seem real. And if attack is perceived as real, then guilt is justified. And if guilt is justified, how can one be wholly innocent? How can one be the innocent child of God? Friend, are you calling it fantasy because it is all pretend and made up? David, yes, it is made up. It is just on the screen. The deceived mind wants to see the conflict in the world, not in the mind. Under the ego's counsel, the mind will look for it in the world. Now, this is not to say that wars per se or sports or verbal abuse is evil or bad. It is the interpretation that has to be looked at. A healed mind can calmly look upon any sight in the world. The body's eyes will still report to the mind changes in circumstances, changes in the way things look, such as symptoms, etc. But a healed mind just puts them all into one category. They're all unreal. You have to have a clear metaphysical idea of why this is so. Of why sickness must be impossible. Of why competition cannot be. Of why there cannot be victims and victimizers in the world. You have to see clearly that it is all in the mind. That it all comes down to the subject-object split. Pride, pleasure and attack are all the same thing. Pride and pleasure are seeming forms of attack. The mind that has identified with the ego is an attack on the Christ within that mind. It is an attack thought, even though it has no basis in reality. It is given reality by the mind's acceptance. To the mind it seems real. The ego's use of the body for pride or recognition for the personal self or for pleasure and so on is all just the attraction of guilt a way of concealing the belief in separation and keeping the mind distracted out on the screen. They are all attack thoughts. Now, to pull it back to right-minded perception, the mind cannot attack. These thoughts are unreal thoughts. Even the thoughts that are called attack thoughts in the workbook are unreal thoughts. They are thoughts that have not come from the mind of God. They do not exist. Only the thoughts that come from God have existence. 
friend. To speak of attack thoughts is just a manner of speaking. David. Yes, they are unreal. A mind that is invested in them is deceived and will experience the hallucination of pain, upset, despair, sorrow and depression. This is because it has invested in thoughts and a thought system that has not come from God. The right mind sees that attack is literally impossible. It sees the false as false. It is not invested in these thoughts. It sees them as false and knows them as false. This is no different than saying that the Holy Spirit sees the false ideas and the false beliefs but looks to the atonement the undefiled altar and is certain of the Christ